Hi, welcome to a lecture on the freeze equation. The freeze equation addresses the situation shown in this figure, which is a radio link, which begins with some power being applied to an antenna over here on the left, and power being received by an antenna on the right. So this is a fundamental question in designing radio links. How much power can you receive given all the other things going on in the link? So let's define some terms. First, P sub T is the total power being transmitted, typically SI base units of watts. G sub T is the gain of the transmit antenna. And by gain, we mean directivity modified by efficiency. So if the antenna is 100% efficient, gain and directivity are the same thing. Of course, directivity is typically expressed in dBi, and so is gain. G sub R is the gain of the receive antenna, again in dBi. R is range, SI base units of meters. And F is frequency. Of course, frequency matters here because frequency determines wavelength, and we know wavelength plays a role in this power transfer. So the question is, given all these things, what is the power delivered to the receiver? And as I've already noted, this is essential for planning radio links, and it will also lead us to the concept of path loss. Path loss is a term which is used quite often in this business. So here's a starting point. The starting point is the defining expression for effective aperture. Namely, the received power, the thing we're looking for, is given by the copolarized incident power density, S super I sub CO, multiplied by the effective aperture. Now, this expression is something derived elsewhere, but um, you can see that's dimensionally correct. Right? The incident copolarized power density is in watts per meter squared. The effective aperture describes the receive antenna, that is, its ability to extract power out of the incident wave, and it has units of meters squared. So watts per meter squared times meters squared gives you watts as expected. Now, you should note that this expression has some built-in assumptions. And those assumptions are important to remember. One is we're assuming copole. We're assuming that the polarization of the antenna is aligned with the polarization of the incident wave. Secondly, we're assuming that the receiver is conjugate matched to the receive antenna. Right? That was a condition in defining the effective aperture. So those are two important assumptions built into this expression. Next, we note that the instant power density can be written in terms of this expression, that is, the transmitted power divided by 4 pi r squared, which describes the spreading of power in a spherical wave, times the transmit gain, which describes the increase in power density relative to an isotropic antenna. So this expression gives you the instant power density. Furthermore, we know that effective aperture can be related to receive gain by this expression, that is the effective aperture is lambda squared, that is wavelength squared, divided by four pi times the receive gain. And also recall that wavelength is just the speed of light divided by frequency in free space. So putting that together, we have that the receive power is equal to the transmit power, divided by this factor that describes spreading in a spherical wave, times the transmit gain, times wavelength squared, divided by 4 pi, times the received gain. And that's really the answer. But typically we clean this up a little bit, because we have some repeated factors here. And that gives us the freeze equation. The freeze equation says that the received power is equal to the transmit power, times the transmit gain, of the antenna that is, times the receive gain, that is the gain of the receive antenna, times this factor in the middle here, which is lambda over 4 pi r, quantity squared. This is referred to as the path gain. It is not the path loss. It's 1 over the path loss. So the path loss, which we give the symbol L sub p, is defined as being this factor raised to the minus 2. Now note that this is in free space. It's in free space, so we're not accounting for the possibility of spreading which is not spherical, and we're not accounting for the possibility of absorption in materials. 
but this accounts for a broad swath of applications, and so it's an important one to know. So summarizing, we can say that receive power equals transmit power times transmit gain times path gain, that is 1 over path loss, times the gain of the receive antenna. And don't forget this relationship between path gain and path loss. Next, note that the path loss, L sub P, is not merely the loss due to spreading. This is a very common misconception and results in a lot of errors in practical work. The loss in power density due to spreading of the wave, due to that spherical spreading of the wave, is different, and you can calculate it. The power density at some distance r compared to the power density at some reference distance, r sub naught, can be written in the following way. You take the transmit power and divide by 4 pi r squared. And for the power density at the reference distance, that's the transmit power divided by 4 pi r naught squared. And now if you get rid of like factors, you find that this ratio, which is the spreading gain, is the ratio of the distances squared. Now note that this is independent of frequency unlike the path loss, which increases with frequency. You can see that up here, that dependence on wavelength. So spreading gain or spreading loss is not the whole story here. Path loss is a function of wavelength and this spreading factor. Just to elaborate here, the frequency, and we're expressing it here in terms of wavelength, this dependence on path loss comes from the frequency dependence in the effective aperture, A sub E. So in other words, the path loss is accounting not just for spreading, but also for the frequency dependence of the effective aperture of the receive antenna. It accounts for both. All right, let's do an example. The example we'll do here is the L1 frequency of GPS, of the Global Positioning System. The L1 frequency is the frequency that accounts for the service that most people know, which is position location. GPS satellites transmit at 1575.42 megahertz, at least that's the center frequency. GPS satellites are in medium Earth orbit, or MEO. So they move through the sky, so the distance between the satellite and the receiver varies. But for this example, we'll take a typical value, which is 21,000 kilometers. Now there's not much between a GPS satellite and the receiver, so these are essentially free space conditions. So as I promised earlier, the free space path loss consideration applies to many practical problems, and this is one of them. The power transmit by GPS satellite is something like 25.6 watts. The gain of the GPS transmit antenna is something like 13 dBi. That transmit antenna is a helical antenna, known as a helix, and it transmits right circular polarized radiation. We say it's right circularly polarized. That means the receive antenna must also be right circularly polarized for the freeze equation to work in this case. If the receive antenna is left circularly polarized or linearly polarized, you get a reduced receive power. And then the gain of the receive antenna, that's the gain of the antenna on the handheld device, whatever device is being positioned. Uh, that can vary quite a bit, but we'll take 0 dBi as a typical value, and that is in fact a typical value. So given all that, we can compute the wavelength. The wavelength is speed of light divided by frequency, we get 19 centimeters. We need the transmit gain in linear units, so that's 10 raised to 13 divided by 10 which is 19.9, again, linear units. We need g sub r in linear units, while 0 dBi is just 1 in linear units. So now we have the linear units that we need for the equation. Next, we compute the free space path loss. Again, by definition, that's wavelength divided by 4 pi range raised to the minus 2. That gives us 1.92 times 10 to the 18th. And that corresponds to 182.8 dB. So one thing you'll note here is that path loss is really big. It is normally very, very large. 182 dB is enormous. What that means is that the path gain is a very, very, very small, which corresponds to what you expect. You'd expect very little of the transmit power to make it to the receiver.
So the received power using the freeze equation is transmit power times gain of the transmit antenna divided by path loss times gain of the receive antenna. That gives us 2.67 times 10 to the minus 16 watts, which is the same as minus 155.7 dBW, that is dB relative to a watt. This is one of the ways that this is commonly written, even more commonly written in terms of milliwatts. So in dB relative to 1 milliwatt, that's minus 125.7 dBm. And note that all this is for a co-polarized, that is right circularly polarized antenna, as I previously noted. And because of the assumptions we use to come up with the freeze equation, assumes a conjugate matched receiver. Two additional notes I'd like to make here before concluding this video. And those both pertain to the same issue, that conditions are not always free space. Again, free space is a common assumption, and it applies in many cases. But there are two important scenarios which you should know about where the free space assumption is not quite correct. The first is terrestrial propagation, where we have the possibility of ground bounce. What do I mean by that? Well, we have a transmit antenna. We have a receive antenna. We have a direct path between them. And that would normally experience free space path loss. But we also have a reflected path, something which bounces off the ground, the reflected path. That path also experiences free space path loss. But we have two of these paths now, and they can go in and out of phase with each other. So the path loss is somewhat different in this scenario. And in fact, it's easy to show that it's generally worse. So we're not going to do that derivation here. I'll simply tell you what the result is. The result is that what we had previously for free space path loss becomes this expression, where the minus 2 that we had for free space becomes minus n. I'll tell you that n is commonly referred to as the path loss exponent for obvious reasons. It's an exponent in that expression. And whereas n is 2 for free space, it is somewhere between 2 and 5 for scenarios where we have this ground bounce. Now I'll also tell you that n equals 4 is very typical. In fact, in the ideal case, the case that corresponds to exactly what I'm showing here, n equals 4 beyond a certain distance. In fact, in this scenario, you find that n transitions from being very nearly 2 to being very nearly 4 as you increase the distance. So that's one common exception to the free space uh, situation. The second exception to the free space assumption is frequencies SHF and higher, and especially millimeter waves, but not always, just when we have the possibility of absorption. Absorption refers to the dissipation of power into the medium through which the wave transmits. What happens is that frequencies SHF and higher and in particular in millimeter waves, is that molecules in the air can absorb power in the radio wave. This is particularly acute at 60 gigahertz, for example. At 60 gigahertz, there is very strong absorption. In fact, the absorption dominates over the spreading of the power density. And this effect can happen at other frequencies as well, and just generally applies at higher frequencies. So to model that effect, we include this factor here, which is an exponential. And you see it's an exponential that depends on distance, and this factor alpha. Alpha is an attenuation constant. So at low frequencies, alpha is pretty low, and so this factor becomes pretty close to 1. But at higher frequencies, and in particular depending in detail on what frequency you're at, alpha can become large enough that this dominates and that this is a relatively small effect. So this is something to know about relatively high frequency communications. That concludes this lecture on the freeze equation.